Okay, would you please rise for the reading of the scripture? First, I'm reading from John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For father's, my Father's house has many rooms. If that was not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Now, Revelations 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street, street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healings of the nations. No longer will there be any cure. The throne of the God of the Lamb of this will be the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will be, them, will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord for the people of the people. Yeah, people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate that. Well, you've heard before people say things like, I've got some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? In fact, there's several jokes on that predication. I kind of feel that way as we come to the end of this series. We've been, I've been doing sermons based on your input, things you wanted to hear about, subjects. So last week was the bad news. I preached on hell, which I have never really done before. And this week is the good news. I'm going to talk about heaven. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to look into your word. Let your word look into us and encourage our hearts today, Father, uh, about a future we have with you. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. There are so many misperceptions about heaven out in the world today. Not just about whether or not there is such a place or such a destiny, but what such a place and such an existence will be like. The natural mogul Ted Turner, in speaking many years ago to the National Press Club, said this, Remember, heaven is going to be perfect, and I don't really want to be there. Those of us that go to hell, which will be most of us in this room, most journalists, he said, are certainly going there. Who wants to go to a place that's boring? Or, pardon me, he wants to go to a place that's perfect. And then he said, boring, boring. I used to like those far side cartoons that Gary Larson did. I don't know if y'all ever watched them. And he had one of a man sitting on a cloud in heaven with angel wings saying, I wish I'd brought a magazine. What misunderstanding there are about heaven and about eternity. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author and thinker, had this to say about people who don't understand heaven. He said, quote, There is no need to be worried by facetious people who try to make the Christian hope of heaven ridiculous by saying they do not want to spend eternity playing harps. The answer to such people is that if they cannot understand books written for grown-ups, they should not talk about them. So the question, is heaven going to be boring? No way. <laughs> Are we going to sit on clouds and play harps for eternity? So as we look at the subject of heaven this morning, we read from that familiar passage in the book of John, chapter 14, a passage you've heard over and over again, particularly when it comes to funeral messages for believing Christians, where Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. For those people out there, and I don't know there's anybody in this room who feels that way, but for those people who think the idea of eternity is just a myth or impossible to believe in, I want to encourage you this morning to take another look. There is the possibility of heaven within the context of the universe in which we live. The physics of Isaac Newton considered the universe infinite. Albert Einstein, as well as other physicists, refuted Newtonian physics, proving that there is an expanding universe. So what exactly is the universe expanding into? What's beyond the boundaries? You see, even our universe isn't infinite. Only God is. And Einstein also gave us a different way of thinking and understanding infinity within the context of our own universe with his theory of relativity, with the fourth dimension of time. You know, according to Einstein's theory, the faster that I travel relative to you, the more slowly time will pass relative to you. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend, but let me give you an instance. For instance... If I were in a rocket traveling 130,000 miles per second, and I was gone from the earth for 10 years, when I returned, I would have aged 10 years, while everybody else on earth would have aged 20 years, according to Einstein's theory of relativity. With me traveling at that speed, 20 years of your time would transpire in 10 years of my time. If I could travel 150,000 miles per second, 1,000 years of your time would transpire in a day of my time. That made me think of the verse. A thousand years to God is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. But here's the clincher. At the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, then all of human history and the history of the planet itself would be compressed into a moment which has no extension of time and could properly be called now. Eternity, the absence of time, no time, an eternal now. That's fascinating. So I find it fascinating that even modern science hold out the possibility of eternity. But we don't look to science to tell us what to believe anyway. Exactly what kind of place is this place called heaven? Well, the best description of it is found in those two passages we were, that were read from the Bible uh, earlier from the book of Revelation. We're going to also look at a few other verses from Revelation. But what clues does John give us in those passages? One thing you can say... It certainly doesn't sound boring. <laughs> so this morning, let me give you five reasons why heaven won't be boring. First one's this. Heaven won't be boring because we will be exploring its infinite beauty. Think of all the pictures, the descriptions that John gave us. Uh, he said... What was just read? Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit and a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Think of the most beautiful place you've ever seen in your life. Did it just take your breath away? I think mine would be Vancouver, British Columbia. Some of you may have seen prettier places than that even. But you can't even begin to compare that to what heaven will be like. It's indescribable. 
Pick your 10 favorite moments from your life. You land your dream job. You travel to your most desired vacation spot. You meet the love of your life. You land uh, another opportunity. You, you, you watch your first child being born. You push your grandchild in a swing. I've done that. And hear them laugh with glee. You see the most beautiful mountain view you've ever seen. And you go, ah, it's breathtaking. And yet with all that, one day with God is better than a lifetime of your favorite moments. Heaven will be what we most long for. For someone, say a refugee in the developing world today, heaven may represent a family reunited, a, a home abundant with food and fresh drinking water. Heaven stands, heaven stands for the fulfillment of every true longing. And its beauty will be both breathtaking and indescribable. So heaven can't be boring because of its infinite beauty. The second thing, heaven can't be boring because we'll be enriched by meeting new friends. I'm going to read from another verse in the book of Revelation. Listen to this from chapter 7. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. Now that doesn't mean we'll always be wearing white robes and waving palm branches. Revelation chapter 7 is describing a specific coronation event in heaven. But notice the multitude from every tribe and nation and language. Those will be our fellow citizens in heaven. You know, there's a part of me that wishes I could know each of you better, and maybe you wish you could know me better. But in this life, we all have a sin-influenced heart that drives us to isolate ourselves. We're shy, we're withdrawn, because we're afraid of either hurting other people or maybe other people hurting us. And in this life, we have to admit, there are some annoying obnoxious people. The thought of spending eternity with them gives us the willies. <laughs> but imagine when they are transformed to be like Jesus. And so are you. And so am I. In case maybe we give somebody else the willies. <laughs> Dan Schaefer, who wrote a book in the heaven, uh, who I, some of the ideas I'm sharing with you today came from that book, but here's what he wrote. Heaven will be a city of new people, regenerated, renewed, and perfect. Imagine upon arriving in heaven that you discovered to your delight that the first person you met loved you so dearly and deeply that it fairly took your breath away and that this expression of love neither embarrassed you nor made you feel strange. You were able to receive this person's love as easily as he or she was able to give it. Then imagine the next person you met loved you with an equivalent but unique, perfect love as well. On, our, on earth, here's what he continued to say, on earth all our love is sin infected and sin affected. And the best of our loves has to struggle with resentment, envy, Jealousy, pride, anger, and other sinful ingredients. In heaven, each person will be a new best friend. Here's the third reason. Heaven can't be boring because we will be engulfed in a symphony of praise. 
John describes a great worship scene in the book of Revelation back in chapter 5. Here's what he wrote. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This is not your normal church service. The idea of heaven being an eternal church service really isn't that appealing to most folks. John Eldridge, who's written many books, uh, Christian books, confessed this idea. He said this, We have settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever, all men. And our heart sinks. Forever and ever? That's it? That's the good news? And then he goes on to say, and then we sigh and feel guilty that we're not more spiritual. We lose heart and we turn once more to the present to find what life we can. Well, relax. Heaven is not going to be 6,000 verses of the same praise chorus. It's not going to be a sermon that lasts 40 years. Instead, Praise and worship will be the very atmosphere of heaven. Someone has stated that praise in heaven will be like the soundtrack of a great movie. The music is there, but you're not always really aware of it, except it's moving you and enhancing the enjoyment of your experience. So praise. Fourth one. Heaven can't be boring because we will be energized by serving the Lord. This was in the passage we read this morning. Chapter 22, verse 3, he said this, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. You won't be sitting on a cloud reading a magazine. You're going to be working in heaven. You'll be serving the Lord. We will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Now, I can't tell you, I don't know exactly what we will be doing in heaven, but I know we'll be doing something. When Jesus taught us to pray, He said, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means something's being done in heaven. In heaven, His kingdom is a total reality. Kings reign. And other passages in the New Testament tell us that as believers, we will reign with Him. What does that mean? I don't know exactly. But at least I think it means we will have something to do in that kingdom for our King. You'll be working in eternity. You'll be serving the Lord, but you won't get weary. You won't get tired. You'll be energized and fulfilled. I think you'll accomplish something so amazing that it will give you a feeling of euphoria. You remember the time when you accomplished something that you really was a hard task and you drove and you drove and you finally got to the end? Do you remember how you felt completing that task? That's what it's going to be like working in heaven. And finally, heaven can't be boring because we'll be enjoying the presence of Jesus. I saved the best for last. The very best thing about heaven is seeing the face of Jesus. The book of Revelation, one more time, from chapter 22, and they will see His face And His name will be written on their foreheads. That's talking about a future so different from what the Apostle Paul told us in the book of 1 Corinthians in the present. He said this, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. The language Paul gives us is of a blurred image. It's it's like looking at a picture that's out of focus or, or like trying to see your face in a mirror. That's all fogged up from the steam of the shower. You can see something, 
but it's not clear. And that is the best glimpse of heaven you and I can get in this life. You see, those of us who love Jesus are always looking for His face. We see it dimly now with eyes of faith, but one day we will look straight into the face of Jesus. And His name will be on our foreheads, John says. I believe that means that Jesus will be foremost in our minds and our thoughts and therefore in our hearts. Because the essence of heaven is the presence of Jesus. Heaven is where Jesus is. And when we are in heaven, we'll be with Him forever. When you see Jesus face to face, your deepest yearning for acceptance and intimacy will be fulfilled. In this life, you may be single, you may be widowed, you may be divorced, but in heaven, all previous relationships or lack thereof will be overshadowed by a powerful love relationship with Jesus. And so we see in the Bible, Heaven is not an afterthought. It's not an optional belief. It's the final justification of all creation. What God did from the very beginning. And as you read the Bible, the Bible never belittles human tragedy and disappointments and the things that we encounter in this life. But it does add one word. Temporary. What we feel now, we will not always feel. The time for recreation will come. The end will actually be a new beginning. And so the big question this morning is, what difference does it make? How does believing in eternity affect my life right now? If we truly believe that God has prepared an eternal home for us, then it will make a difference in two major ways. We will live with hope every single day. Regardless of the circumstances around us, life may or may not get better here, but we can know that God's home awaits us. Number two, if we truly believe, we will be motivated to share the gospel with more people to lead them into a relationship with Christ because we want to share this great hope with others. Do you truly believe in eternal life? Do you really believe in a place called heaven? Then that won't just affect your life in the future. It will make a difference in how you live your life in the present right now. I added something this morning I want to share with you because I think from both sermons on hell and heaven, the vital thing we have to understand is it comes down to a choice. It comes down to a choice this week and last week. And it's a choice about the person of Jesus. God created you. He created you in love. He created you in His image. And He loves you. And He wants a love relationship with you and me and with everybody. But love cannot be coerced or forced. It has to be a choice. I can't make somebody love me. That's not love. And so God, making us in His image, gave us freedom of choice. That's part of it. It's a choice we get to make. And we decide our destiny. The most profound four-line poem I ever read. For now, as in ancient times, man by himself is priced. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas sold himself not Christ. 
In that transaction that Judas made with the priest, he didn't determine that Jesus was worth 30 pieces of silver. He determined his life, his heart, could be sold for 30 pieces of silver. You see, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul says, for God demonstrated His love for us once for all, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has already made His choice. He loves you. And He invites you through accepting the gift He offers through His Son to love Him back. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the provisions You give us each and every day. We thank You for the love You give us each and every day. May we be overwhelmed like the Apostle John. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. It's overwhelming right now. I can't even imagine how overwhelming it's going to be one day in eternity with you. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here, if there's anybody here that's never responded to your love, your kindness, your goodness, they would be drawn to you today. And they would respond in love to a God who loves them. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, and for His sake. Amen.